Collecting dressed fleas and transporting shrunken heads across international borders. The most interesting man alive returns. I'm Richard. And I'm Gary. And these are our incredible stories. Hello and welcome back to all of our listeners from around the world and across the United States. We're so happy to have you back with us again for some more incredible stories. If you have found your way over here because you were curious about what we had to say, well, welcome. And guess what? You're in luck because we've got a lot to share with you, and including what we have to share today. But uh, if you like what you're hearing, well, go ahead, hit that subscribe button and join us each and every Friday for some more incredible stories. Trust me. You are not going to be disappointed. No, we've had over 3,000 folks download our uh, episodes, Gary. So Probably more than that, too. I think we're, we're really up there now. Yeah, yeah. Well, um, tonight um, we're going to be talking once again with uh, Edward Meyer. And if you recall from our previous two weeks, uh, he's the author of a fantastic book. I enjoyed every single moment of it, but then again, I'm a history buff and and like the unusual and the strange and the bizarre, so it was right up my alley. And that's the title of the book, Buying the Bazaar, and uh, it's based on 40 years of uh, Edward's uh, adventures with Ripley's Entertainment, and these are the folks who uh, bring you Ripley's Believe It or Not. So welcome back to the podcast, Edward. Well, thank you. I feel very privileged. Three three weeks in a row. I must be doing something like <laughs> Yes, yes, absolutely. You do. And uh, let me see. I think, if I'm not mistaken, um, next week Gary is going to be Thanksgiving. So uh, Edward's uh, podcast will be our Thanksgiving holiday podcast. Well, there you go, making yeah. it making it even more special. Yeah, yeah. Oh boy, I'm not sure I have any turkey stories. <laughs> uh, that's okay. That's yeah. all right. <laughs> None of what you've uh, been telling us uh, would be regarded as a turkey, that's for sure. <laughs> uh, listen, um, Edward, uh, I mentioned in our uh, little intro there, dressed fleas, nobody, I mean, nobody knows what I'm talking about there. Can you uh, enlighten us a little bit? Well, there's that. that is definitely one of the most interesting things that uh, I ever purchased. Um. Everybody has heard of a flea circus. Not too many people have actually seen one at this point in history. Uh, a 19th century uh, gimmick, I guess is a good enough word, but little tiny circus apparatus operated by fleas that, believe it or not, can be trained. And then if that isn't weird enough, you got people in Mexico that would make little tiny costumes for the little tiny fleas so they looked like they were circus characters. Good grief. Uh, <laughs> Orville Elton lived in, uh, well, I guess it's safe to say in Seattle, but in the Seattle area, uh, was the collector of all things miniature. Thousands and thousands of items. Uh, I think he had like 60,000 things that would all fit in, you know, into your pocket. Uh, nothing any bigger than, you know, an inch long sort of thing. And I first visited him in 1988, and I was looking very specifically for dress fleet, uh, which I'd heard of and was told that he was the guy that was going to be able to supply me some. And there's a store, and it's still there in Seattle, called the Ye Old Curiosity Shop. And they actually had a Mexican lady that sat in that store in the 30s with a magnifying glass and showed her skill at making little tiny costumes. So Ripley had been there, and he bought directly from the store, and he displayed them in his museum, his auditorium in New York City in 1940. And I just thought that that was one of the weirdest, coolest things I'd ever heard about and after I did a little bit of work and found out that there's this guy that had a collection of them, I had to go see them for myself. So dress fleas, the costumes come from Mexico, the fleas come from dogs and cats anywhere, but they are a real thing. Uh, obviously super tiny, you need 
at least a magnifying glass, if not a microscope to see them. But um, there you go. That's, that's it. And if you uh, ever have the uh, uh, opportunity to see an actual flea circus, and there's still a couple around the world, mainly in Germany, um, it, it's a fascinating little piece of history. And Gary just uh, showed me on uh, the laptop um, something he found on the Internet, an image of costumed fleas. The right? dressed fleas, yep. Yeah, and... <laughs> if you, if you couldn't make that up. No. <laughs> it, it's so strange looking at them. <laughs> They're a real thing. Yeah. Uh, is, I think that is one of the most bizarre things I've seen in a while. Yeah, yeah. So oh, yeah. folks, folks <laughs> who are... Li- in... in inside matchboxes or yeah. walnut chips. Yeah, you know? that's them. <laughs> so so folks who are listening to this flea first, story. First, first, first I bought, I paid $5 for a, a, a husband and wife, you know, a, a pair of fleas. <laughs> <laughs> so explain that to the accountant. You know, yeah, right. You know, <laughs> you know, what's this $5 invoice for a flea? You know? yeah. <laughs> what's this mine? You know, what's going on there? <laughs> right. Oh, uh, you know, uh, I guess uh, Ripley's could have uh, bought an in-house costumer and uh, Fleas could have been collected for nothing and have the in-house costumer do the costumes. Well, you know, you can you can get Fleas pretty easy, but <laughs> making the costumes is a real talent. Oh, yeah, <laughs> without a doubt. So, folks uh, who are listening to this incredible story, uh, you can go on the Internet. What did you do, Gary? Just search I just Googled. Fleas. Yeah, I Googled uh, dressed fleas, and they, it popped dressed up. Dressed fleas, and it pops up. And so everybody can see exactly uh, what Edward's talking about here, dressed fleas. Uh, some of the other things, um, you uh, also um, had some interesting adventures that you uh, relate in your book, uh, Buying the Bazaar, about trying to transport real human shrunken heads across international borders? Well, probably the single uh, iconic Ripley item are Havaro Indian shrunken heads from South America, the the corner of uh, Peru and Ecuador. There's five historic tribes that did this to each other as a war trophy. Um, it is a real head. It has the skull has been removed, and the skin, like leather, has been boiled down to about baseball fist size. Oh wow! Now, Rip, Ripley himself had three of these. Uh, he got them directly in Ecuador, South America, in his travels. Uh, but you know. Again, everybody's heard of them. Not too many people have seen them, and even fewer people believe that it's real. But it is. Uh, and I, I stress that it's a war trophy. I mean, this is, you know, the fine line between murder and war, but this is something that happens in battle to somebody you didn't like. And then the person taking the head preserved it as a trophy saying, you know, I was better than this other warrior. In the indigenous tribes, they typically only kept them for a couple years and then they buried them. So shrunken heads probably were never a, a real commodity, but over time get rare and rare. There's just none in existence. So, As something that Ripley himself bought and displayed, uh, I took it upon myself to try and add to the Ripley collection of shrunken heads and was fairly successful at it. I I bought a lot of shrunken heads in my career. Uh, They all come from the same place, but amazingly, they show up in Hamburg, Germany or Sydney, Australia, but they all come from one little area, corner of Peru and Ecuador. The main tribal name is Ibarro, uh, J-I-B-A-O. And um, they are truly, truly uh, unique anthropological piece that most museums are scared or, you know, morally will not display. So seeing one at Ripley's is one of the only places that you will ever see them. That is interesting. 
at some point, you know, they may be repatriated. Uh, they haven't been to date. Um, you know, North American Indians are a lot stronger bound than South American Indians, it seems. But, um, you know, once you bought it, you've got to move it. That can get pretty dicey. And, you know, it, it's not illegal to own it. It's not illegal to carry it. It's not illegal to display it. But it is illegal to transport it. Huh. So <laughs> you, you need to have the proper paperwork to assure that it's, uh, its history, its origin, its age, uh, before you can take it anywhere. And I personally only ever had real difficulty in, uh, I was going to England. Getting it into England wasn't too much of a problem, but going from England to Ireland, uh, it became a very big issue. But uh, as strange as it may sound, I was able to talk my way out of trouble. And in general, the Customs people really just wanted to see it and have their picture taken with it because they'd never seen such a thing. <laughs> so it's not something I would advise. Uh, they're obviously very expensive, so it's not uh, something yeah. too people collect. But there are people out there that collect them. And, um, you know, it's, it's a hard word to describe, but some are decorated very beautifully that people consider them art. Mm. Wow, very unusual art. And uh, Edward, I think in one of the Ripley's books that I was uh, looking through, I actually saw a shrunken head that looked like a, a woman. Did they shrink women's heads also? Well, exceedingly rare. Uh, earlier when we were talking about this, please, I mentioned the Yield Curiosity Shop in Seattle. Uh, they have a female shrunken torso uh, cut off at the waist, so it has breasts but it does not have arms, so it's a torso with a head on it. To my knowledge, it is one of only three, and Ripley's owns the other two. One of them previously was owned by Ernest Hemingway and purchased in Key West, Florida. Uh, and even rare, there's at least two, possibly three, entire Navarro shrunken bodies out there. Uh they are sort of the holy grail of mummy dumb. Mm. Mm. Wow. That is, that is an incredible subject all of its own. Yeah. yeah. Uh, there's a uh, professor at, in Gainesville at the university of Florida and his name might come to me while we're talking, but uh, he first went to Ecuador to study beetles in fluorescent iridescent beetles and discovered that these were the prime preferred decoration for shrunken heads and got interested in shrunken heads. And I guess maybe around maybe the late 90s, early 2000s, he wrote the definitive book on shrunken heads. Uh, Kastner, Kast, Kastner, maybe C-A-S-T-A-N-E-R. Uh, there are other books on shrunken heads, but he is the world's authority, and he's right here in Florida. Huh? And oh, I, wow. I think for our listeners, uh, just about any of the uh, Ripley's Entertainment uh, books will at least have one image of a shrunken head. That's probably safe to say. Uh, mm -hmm. I ended up buying over 100 in my career. Wow. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, from his collection of three. Yeah. So that, uh, his collection really was expanded, uh, under your care. Um, and to, to lighten the subject, I got the nickname, the head guy. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh -huh. and master of oddities too, Edward. <laughs> and how about, uh, going on now to some of the other unusual things because shrunken heads while are the premier, uh, Ripley's uh, display artifact. There are some other things that uh, I think maybe some of our listeners have never even heard of before, um, such as the Iron Maiden. Are you going to draw uh, the Iron Maiden up on the uh, computer there, Gary? So we see. Uh, it? Oh, absolutely. Okay. Yeah. What about what's the Iron Maiden, uh, Edward? Well, this is a medieval slash torture item. Um, it really isn't about torture. It's about murder. You you will not 
survive the Iron Maiden. But Robert Ripley bought one in Nuremberg, Germany in 1923. And again, it was displayed in virtually every Ripley's museum over, over the last hundred years. Uh, but I had a chance to buy one in Germany. Uh, again, I'm going to say it was in the late 90s. It may have been a little earlier, a little later than that. But, you know, give or take 25 years ago. And I'd like to say that mine's even better than the one Robert Ripley bought. But uh, So the company has two. These are from the Spanish Inquisition era. Uh, if you were accused of witchcraft or some other very serious disease, problem criminal event uh you the maiden opens up from the belly two doors swing open headpiece is separate but it opens up like a mask and inside are big huge scary spikes if you are pushed into the iron maiden and the doors closed on you you have about 15 spikes go through every part of your body there is no surviving the Iron Maiden. So the whole point is you better confess before you get tortured uh, because you will not survive the Iron Maiden. And this, uh, they're typically called the Iron Maiden of Nuremberg. Uh, almost every Nuremberg castle seems to have had one at some point, but they, they were used in Spain as well as Germany. And they are just plain nasty. There's no doubt about it. Again, uh, the one that I purchased was featured on our second Ripley's television show that came out in the 2000s with Dean Kane as the host. Uh, so you could probably find that online if you want to see what it looks like. And I'm not sure which Ripley Museum it is in right now. Uh, for most of its career, it was in New York City, but I believe New York is uh, closed due to COVID. Uh, you know, uh, so I'm not sure where it is in the Ripley collection, but it dates, it's actually got the date right on it. And if I recall, it's like 1460 or something like that. And it is in mint condition. It is a spectacular artifact of man's inhumanity to man. It seems to me that uh, at one point uh, I actually saw one of these Iron Maidens. Could it, is it possible that it could have been at the uh, St. Augustine Museum? Well, the uh, the one that Ripley himself purchased was in St. Augustine um, up until maybe 1989. Major renovation in St. Augustine in 89 where we took out every single thing that was in that show and put an all-new show in. Uh, so it hasn't been there since then, but it, it was there before that. Okay, that might be uh, where I, because uh, in the back of my mind, uh, I... They do have an Iron Maiden at the uh, the Ripley's Museum in St. Augustine. It opens up and you see the ghost inside of it and then it closes. Uh -huh. All right, so that is an imitation. That is uh, not okay. a real... Replica. A replica, a replica. got it. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and that, you know, uh, a little bit of haunted house sort of trickery that it, it's a holographic illusion that you see the bloody body of a witch. Yeah, that's uh, it. <laughs> as you walk by, and, and you don't do anything. The doors open just as you're standing there by magic. And uh, that was made by a company out of New York City uh, in the early 1960s. And that that's more or less what a real one looked like, but that one it has no iron in it whatsoever. <laughs> it's all fiber. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so we got a good idea of what the Iron Maiden actually looked like. Yeah. Uh, but, uh, yeah, a, and, and, you know, it would be very solid, heavy wood with iron face mask and iron reinforcement. Mm -hmm. well, that's why it gets its name. Iron. But it has a, like a woman, so it's an iron maiden. Uh-huh. <laughs> that makes sense. Yep, yep. From uh, torture instruments to uh, John Wayne, America's uh, number one cowboy, I guess. And uh, <laughs> Well... John Wayne uh, is the biggest, yeah, that might not even be safe to say, one of the biggest pieces of lint art in the Ripley's collection. These are portraits of celebrities, Hollywood, and political figures made by a lady in uh, Long Beach, California, who, who passed away a couple years ago, but uh, she was very active 
in the art world in California for about 50 years. And her big thing was making portraits out of laundry lint. The fluff that comes out of your dryer. <laughs> so if, if, if you wanted bright red, you put a bunch of red sweaters in and get red fluff. And if she wanted blue, and there's a lot of blue in the John Wayne, he's got mm-hmm. denim jacket and denim shirt, uh, denim pants, I meant. And, uh, you know, you put in a bunch of blue jeans to get blue fluff. <laughs> so when we were opening our museum in Hollywood uh, in the mid-1980s, this was, so this is going back a ways, and we'd already bought a couple things from her, but John Wayne was the first commission piece we did. And we said, you know, we want something about John Wayne. And he's a big guy. I think it's six foot four, six foot five. Uh, so, you know, a life-size portrait of John Wayne. He's got the big hat. He's got a gun in his hand. He's got the big belt buckle made completely of laundry lint. And this, and believe it or not, and I try not to say that too much, but, uh, oh, maybe we bought 30 pieces from this one artist. And those 30 pieces displayed in Ripley's museums around the world caused at least two other people to copy her and make lint art. So there's at least three people out there making art from laundry lint. That sure there is a lot more, a lot cheaper uh, for supplies than getting oil paints and things. That, that's true. <laughs> yeah, laundry lint sounds great. <laughs> well, they're very, very colorful and for the most part, very realistic. You've got to get pretty close to, to it to not know that it's, you know, to think that, oh, I just thought it was an oil painting. What, what's it made out of? And until somebody tells you, you will not know that it's laundry. No, no. Uh, was uh, Da Vinci's Last Supper also done uh, with laundry lint? Well, yes, but not by the same artist. That's by one of the artists that, that was modeled after and, uh, that lady lives up in Grand Rapids, Michigan. But our biggest uh, replica of, of Da Vinci's Last Supper is actually made from burnt toast. Oh, Three, wow. 365 individual pieces of toast. The artist is Tadahiko Ogawa from Japan. And he does it in a flat toaster, not a pop-up toaster, but a flat toaster oven. He covers the piece of bread with aluminum foil and cuts out the portion he wants to burn, to give color to. Like a jigsaw puzzle, he then puts all the pieces together to form pictures. And, And Tadahiko specializes in old masters. So we have, uh, Venus's Botticelli, uh, oh, so there's a couple Rembrandt, et cetera, et cetera. But the largest he ever did was 300 and I think it's 384. I said 64 a second ago, but I think it's 384. 384 pieces of burnt toast, and it gets you about a 10 foot by 6 foot portrait of Da Vinci's Last Supper. Did he also now, do the Mona Lisa? He's done the Mona Lisa as well. Um, you know, virtually every famous painting you could could name from the Renaissance type era uh, done in toast. Now, the interesting thing here, and this, this is a shout out to a person I haven't seen in 40 years sort of thing, but both the stories originally of lint art and toast art were discovered by my assistant whose name was Kim Birch in the National Enquirer. Really? So I talked weeks ago about finding stories any, any and everywhere. Well, this young lady used to buy the National Enquirer every week when she did her grocery shopping, and she'd come in every Monday and said, got to read this story. And a lot of people, you know, instantly roll their eyes when you talk about the National Enquirer. But if you look at the National Enquirer, you instantly can tell whether the story is true or not. If it's a made-up story, there's no addresses. This person just lives, okay? But <laughs> if they say, you know, Tadahiko uh, Okawa from such and such a place in Japan, you've got a place where you can start your research and discover whether he's a real person or not. And, you know, 
more often than you might think, the stories were real. And those are maybe the only two stories that I can recall that we ever got from the National Enquirer, but they became lifetime Ripley stories. I mean, we probably got 40 or 50 pieces of lint art, 40 or 50 pieces of toast art based on going back every couple of years and buying something else from the same artist. <laughs> so uh, shout out to Bert somewhere in Southern Ontario. Uh, used to work for me in the 1980s. Haven't, haven't seen her since. And what was her name again, uh, Edward? Kim Birch. Okay. So hopefully somebody is listening to this that might know her. She's the original discoverer of laundry lint art and toast art. (laughs) There you go. (laughs) Thanks to the National Enquirer. Gary, that sounds like some kind of art you might want to try with Oliver, the toast. (laughs) Oh, yeah. Oh, I burn toast regularly. So, you know, now I could turn it into an art form. Uh, Yeah. I've got a question for uh, Edward, Gary, that... um, really um, is not the easiest one to answer. Uh, Edward, do you really believe that there might be some real honest-to-goodness vampire killing kits? Are they all just sideshow stuff? Oh, boy. Well, I don't know if I believe in vampires, but I do believe in vampire killing kits, for sure. Um, Again, this this is a a boxed item, some of them very fancy, you know, handmade wooden boxes, but a, a kit, several pieces inside a wooden box to prevent, harm, kill vampires. And these were originally made in Boston for American tourists in the 19th century traveling to Transylvania. And you know, depending on how rich you were, how elaborate some of these are. You know, the, the, the cross may be ivory instead of wood, or you know, may have your name monogrammed in gold on the on the lid. Uh, the ones that are authentic from the 19th century are pretty identifiable from the ones that aren't. And you know, somewhere in the vampire fad uh, that has been going on at least since the 1930s, if not older. Uh, people started replicating these. And I actually did find one in Romania that is so totally different than all the rest of them that either it's the fake or the other ones are the fake because there's like almost no similarity except for a mallet and a wooden wooden stake. But um, we mentioned New Orleans earlier, and uh, I, I can't remember if that was this week or last week, but... Uh, Bill Rao has one of the most beautiful antique stores in the entire world. And he personally has some interest in vampires living in New Orleans, I guess, has some background. And I bought my first one from him and I paid a lot of money for it. And he sort of, you know, would you be interested in more of these? And I said, I would always be interested in these because whether they're real or not, these are an amazing unique thing that nobody's ever seen you know it fits the ripley ripley uh you know criteria so somehow or another about every two years bill would find another one so bill bill rao is the supplier of vampire killing kits uh for ripley's believe it or not for the most part some of them are obvious things uh, a luger instead of a derringer you know is, is a pure giveaway yeah. but um I certainly believe they were real initially. Uh, And if, you know, if you put out the ones in front of you, I could say this one, I believe in this one. I don't. Mm -hmm. And uh, the, the interesting thing is whether they work or not is a whole whole different question. (laughs) Then we get to whether or not you believe in vampires or not. (laughs) There you go. But the the two things that uh, stand out uh, as really unusual to me, Edward is, uh, stop and think of what you just said. How many tourists, and they had to be very wealthy, back in the mid-1800s or so, uh, traveled to Transylvania? Well, you know, we, we think of Transylvania uh, specifically about vampires, but, you know, vampires is Eastern Europe. I mean, it's Poland, it's, it's present-day Czechoslovakia, it's parts of Italy. Um, you know, anybody doing what used to be called the Grand Tour 
you know, might want to have one of these with them because they really believe that there was such a thing. And you know, again, we talked earlier about werewolves. Um, you know, in the 19th century, definitely people really believed in werewolves and vampires and Americans going to Europe wanted to be prepared just in case. And, you know, again, my, my joke was that, you know, you never found a vampire in Ripley's, believe it or not. So obviously they work. <laughs> there you go. Mm -hmm. Makes yeah. sense to me. And then in the early 20th century, uh, people who wanted to take no risk whatsoever, they booked passage on the Titanic because it was unsinkable. That's true. Yeah. So anyhow, um, vampire killing kits. I Anybody, went on... and, 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 you know, again, this is a bit of an aside, but uh, I, I was traveling to New Zealand, Australia, and Thailand. And I was going to be on a TV show that I forgot what the title was, but it, it was uh, a, 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 a total setup. It was a funny crime show, people smuggling into New Zealand. And I knew somewhat about this show, but not a whole lot. And they asked for me to bring specific stuff to the show. And uh, I brought a vampire killing pet with me. And I got off the plane after roughly 18 hours to get to New Zealand from here. And in a very seemingly realistic scene, I got arrested in the airport and they confiscated the vampire killing kit. Uh, but, you know, relatively quickly, I realized I'm on air. This is, this is the TV show. There's no studio. They film it right here. Uh, so, you know, I, I went along with the gag, uh, but then at the end, they wouldn't give me back the vampire killing kit. Oh, no. <laughs> and I said, what the hell is this all about? <laughs> and they didn't realize at the time that the vampire killing kit had a real gun in it. And, of course, the gun didn't have a registration number. Oh. So they confiscated my vampire killing kit on air, on live TV, and it took me about nine days to get it back out of Hawk. And I have never seen the show, but it showed in Canada. And every one of my relatives has seen it and every one of my friends in Canada. And they really thought that they hauled me off the jail for smuggling a vampire killing. <laughs> so <laughs> there you go. My point being that the guns are the giveaway, whether it's a fake or not, because guns can be dated. They can be, you know, you can find out who manufactured them. And, you know, there's, there's no way you can fake an 1860s Derringer sort of thing. Right. That's right. true. Well, uh, but, I, I'm going to give you a little assignment, uh, Edward, when uh, we finish the podcast. Uh, if you uh, go on uh, eBay and uh, uh, go ahead and search for vampire killing kits, you're going to come up with some of the fakiest looking kits that are selling for two to three thousand dollars. Well, there was one about a month ago, and, and we mentioned Barry Anderson. Barry Anderson uh, used to be the head of the Ripley Art Department, and just happens to live in the same neighborhood as I do. Barry sent me a text about a month ago saying, "Did you see this?" and sent me information that one was being auctioned, and I believe it went for seventeen thousand dollars. And as a museum piece, as home decor, it may have been the most beautiful vampire killing kit I've ever seen. In terms of authenticity, it probably was made five years ago. Uh, and sold for $17,000? $17,000. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So sometimes things can get dressed up. Uh, you know, you can put lipstick on the pig. And there you go. Uh, I think what we're going to do uh, next uh, is move to uh, something that we discovered from Barry Anderson. Uh, one of the highlights of his career, he told us, was he got to drive uh, what we call Lee Harvey Oswald's car. Now, in your book, you make it clear that uh, it wasn't really Lee Harvey Oswald's car, but can you tell us a little bit about that car and how it was acquired and what happened to it? Yeah, all, all good questions. Um, boy, I don't remember the gentleman's name who actually owned it, but 
he drove Lee Harvey Oswald to work in the car with the so-called curtain rod that ended up being the rifle uh, wrapped in blankets in the back seat. So it is the President JFK murder car is probably better than the Lee Harvey Oswald car as a title. Uh, big black, 1952, 53 Hudson. Um, interesting looking car, period, but a unique piece of Americana uh, associated with the assassination of JFK. Believe it or not, there used to be a little tiny museum of American tragedy in St. Augustine, Florida. And this is just a little tiny place off the beaten track a little bit. And it was run down as any museum as I've ever been in in my life. And I guess I went there two or three times. Well, eventually they closed down and they auctioned everything in that museum, including the Lee Harvey Oswald car we're talking about. The ambulance that he was taken to the hospital in after he was murdered, after he was shot. And the um, Jane Mansfield car that uh, she died in. So they had three big cars uh, amongst their collection. And I ended up buying uh, just just the one, but uh, I bought a bunch of other stuff, and most of it to deal with Abraham Lincoln and some that was dealing with uh, actor James Dean. And what was the strangest auction I've ever been? They, they had it outside, which is absolutely crazy any month of the year in Florida. So boiling hot, no shade, in the middle of a field. And it had been very poorly advertised, that there was hardly anybody there. And there clearly was nobody there that had more than 20 bucks to spend except for me. And again, we mentioned Drew Hunter, uh, the guy who drew the cartoon on the back of my book. Uh, Drew and I were there. And I probably would have bought all three cars uh, if, if they were in better condition than it turned out they were. They, they were pretty shoddy. The Jane Mansfield in particular needed probably $50,000 worth of work on it. Oh, wow. So anyway, I bought the Oswald car. And I did not pay a whole lot of money for it. Uh, got it relatively cheap because there was no one else bidding on it. I mean, an amazing, important piece of American history. And, you know, like, I'm going, is this real? Am I going to get this for this much money? And then they wanted me to buy the other two cars because I was the only one that had any money, it seemed. And, and the audience was hilarious. They, they got behind me and in front of the auctioneer and say, oh, just sell it to him. And I wouldn't bid because there was no one bidding against me. So, you know, a ridiculous opening bid of, you know, a hundred bucks. And, you know, the auctioneer's going, I can't sell it for a hundred bucks. You know that, sir. And I go, well, you know, no one's going to give you 150. So, you know, take my hundred or not. <laughs> and uh, they, they did not sell the other two cars. Uh, they want, they started the bid at, $8,000, which is oh. all I paid for the Oswald car. Think of that. 8000 bucks is all I paid for it. Wow. Yeah, for that piece of uh, But I wouldn't give 8000 bucks for the other two because no one would bid on them, and I thought I got the best of the three cars already. Mm. Oh, absolutely. Well, it, took, it took them two or three years to get anybody else to pay at least $8,000. That became the, you know, the minimum price, but they both ended up in car museums up in Ohio. Uh, I don't know how much people had to pay to get them fixed, but they were, you know, important cars, but they were in really bad shape. The Jane Mansfield car had actually been left outside. It had raccoons living in it at one oh. point, probably, probably had snakes, definitely had rats. Uh, the upholstery was completely gone, et cetera, et cetera. But uh, I, I thought the Lee Harvey Oswald was one of the best purchases I ever made in terms of a, a historical significant piece. Well, I went on, you know, on television that night and was quoted in the newspapers that we were going to send this to a brand new museum we were building in Dallas. Drew Hunter was the designer of the Dallas Museum, so he was there to back me up. And he said, oh, yeah, this will be great. We're going to put this in Dallas. And it turned out his boss thought it was too controversial and didn't want it. 
So then we sort of had it in our warehouse going, what are we going to do with this thing? And luckily, we ended up opening a second museum in Texas in San Antonio. And we sent it off to San Antonio. And it was there for several years. Uh, and then it was in New Orleans for a little while. And last I know, it was in Baltimore. So it's been at least three Ripley museums. But it, it's probably spent as much time off display as on. Um, you know, uh, it, it surprises me, but maybe it's because I'm Canadian and I was only five years old when Kennedy was killed. Uh, but it's a controversial piece. People get upset about it. So mm-hmm. it's, uh, it's got some history to it, literally. Well, yeah. um, Edward, I'm looking at uh, page 372 in your book, Buying the Bazaar. And on 372, you identify it as a 1954 Hudson. And uh, you say it was owned by Oswald's neighbor, and his name, well, Wesley Frazier. There you go. Your your edition must be slightly different than mine because it's definitely not on page three seventy two in mine. <laughs> That's very tough. But um, yeah, there you go. We're about uh, ready to wrap up our third and final episode uh, on uh, all things amazing and uh, bizarre. And I think we could do it on no better a note than asking you personally um, what what it was like to have um, basically a lifetime immersed in all things Ripley. Well, I had a fabulous lifetime, a fabulous career. I wouldn't uh, trade it for anything else. Um, anytime I ever talked to people, they said, you know, wow, what a great place to work, Ripley's Believe It or Not. Well, within Ripley's Believe It or Not, which is a great place to work. I had the greatest job. Uh, You know, I, I, I was the face and voice of the company for a long time. I got to travel to exotic places better than that. I got to meet fabulous people all over the world, creative people, exciting people, funny people. Uh, Never, never two days the same. Going to work was always a joy because I never knew what was going to happen next. What a wonderful way to spend 40 years of your life. What a terrific way to spend 40 years. There's not a lot of folks who can say that, Edward. Well, there's no one else that can say that they did it for 40 years. Even Robert Ripley himself only did it for 30. <laughs> <laughs> so you got him beat. <laughs> now, I don't I don't know if it really matters, but just, just in case, in my edition of my book, it's, chapter 57 it might be safer to say the lee harvey oswald story rather than a page number uh look for chapter 57 titled lee harvey oswald on the oxen block yeah let me see here i'm looking uh it is chapter 57 in my book too i wonder why there's a different in, a difference in the uh, pagination nevertheless well, the the material is the same and it's all highly highly entertaining and interesting well thank you for saying so So we're going to, uh, on that note, tell you what a privilege and a pleasure it was and an honor to have you here on Richard and Gary's Incredible Stories for three different episodes. And for those of our uh, listeners who have enjoyed each and every moment, we're going to tell them that uh, you're coming back in 2023 to uh, tell us a little bit about the blues. So we're going to be looking forward to that. Well, thanks again for having me on. You're absolutely You're most welcome and so, thank you yes and so meanwhile back at the ranch i'm richard and i'm gary and this was an incredible story even more than incredible <laughs> absolutely i can agree with that one yeah <laughs>